Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, a place where I talk about different topics in the world of aviation. Now today is going to be a little bit of a different video than my previous videos, and that is a new series called Mayday Mystery, where I'm going to tell you a story about different air crashes in history. So when I was younger, I used to love the show called Air Crash Investigations. It was this documentary about different air crashes in history and why they happened, how they happened, and how investigators can actually look at the clues afterwards to solve the mystery of, of what happened and for some reason I'm pretty sure that show like scars people from ever wanting to fly again but for some reason it really sparked my interest in aviation and also lately I've been really getting into like true crime podcasts and videos and I just love their storytelling so I thought what better combination than true crime and air crash investigations so here you have it Mayday Mysteries. I think it's not only super interesting just to read about these events and what happened, but also it's really valuable to learn from them so that we can make air travel safer today, whether that's as pilots or aircraft manufacturers or even as passengers just for us to know. Or this video can just scar you from flying. I'm sorry if that's the case, please stop watching. <laughs> but for our pilot video, we're going to be talking about the accident of Tenerife Airport. This was actually the deadliest air accident in history that took place on the ground. It was a collision between two Boeing 747s at Tenerife Airport. This was in March of 1977. It was basically a string of freak events that if you looked at any single one of them individually, it seemed really minor and trivial and not dangerous at all, but put together, it actually led to this very, very huge tragedy. And so today in this video, we're gonna break all of that down. Stay tuned. It was 9.30 in the morning on March 27, 1977. At Amsterdam Schiphol Airport, a KLM flight 4805 was preparing to take off from Amsterdam headed to Gran Canaria. This was a small island as a part of the Spanish Canary Islands off the coast of Morocco. So this was actually a chartered flight by a Dutch travel group that also had a lot of children on this flight. Presumably they were going on vacation with their family to the Spanish Canary Islands. The captain of this flight was named Jacob Van Zanten and he was a very senior and experienced pilot. So he was around 50 years old and had around 11,000 flight hours. He was also the chief flight instructor for KLM, so his job was actually to train and certify other pilots within the company. Just two months prior to this flight, he had actually given the qualification check to his first officer on this flight. And on top of that, KLM also put his face on a lot of advertisements and in-flight magazines. So he was kind of like this uh, brand image for KLM as well. So his first officer was a little less experienced, but still had 9,000 flight hours. And the flight engineer on this flight had 15,000 flight hours. So needless to say, this was a very experienced crew and this was just a normal day, a normal flight. And they were ready to take off with 14 crew and 200 and 34 passengers. Meanwhile, around 8 in the morning local time at LAX, a Pan American Airlines flight 1736 was getting ready to depart, also for Grand Canaria. So on this flight, there were a lot of people that were of course going on vacation, uh, there were a lot of seniors on this flight, and also a lot of people trying to catch their crews from Grand Canaria. So the plan was that this flight was going to fly to JFK first to refuel and also pick up some passengers and change crew and then head on to their final destination. And the crew that got on at JFK to do the second leg was also very experienced. Between the pilots, the co-pilot, and the flight engineer, they had 46,000 flight hours in total. So both of these flights had very experienced crew. The specific Pan Am 747 aircraft was actually pretty special. It was nicknamed the Clipper and actually performed the inaugural commercial flight of the 747 fleet. Years later, coincidentally, it was also the very first 747 to be hijacked in the air. So 
just an interesting note. So while both of these aircrafts were in the air headed towards Gran Canaria, at 1.15 local time, a small bomb exploded inside a florist shop of Gran Canaria Airport. And a few minutes after the explosion, the authorities received a call from a terrorist organization that claimed responsibility for the bomb and also hinted that there was another one planted in the airport. So of course, authorities decided to evacuate the airport, close down the runways, and divert all of the traffic towards the closest commercial airport, and that was on Tenerife Island, around an hour flight time away. Now, Tenerife was a very popular tourist destination, just like Gran Canaria, but its airport was much smaller. It was just a small regional airport with one runway and one main taxiway and four basically little taxiways that joined the main taxiway to the runway. So, of course, it wasn't built to uh, accommodate for all of these commercial jets that were now piling in. So around 1.30 local time, KLM flight 4805 landed at Tenerife Airport. And of course, to the pilot's dismay, they already see a huge lineup of different commercial jets that were lined up on the small taxiway of this regional airport. But they had no choice but to join the queue and wait for Gran Canaria Airport to open again. Around the same time, Pan Am 1736, again nicknamed Clipper, was approaching Gran Canaria Island, its destination, and was getting ready to land. So unfortunately, they heard the news that they won't be able to land and had to divert. But of course, the crew wasn't happy in hearing this because the majority of the passengers had already been traveling for over 13 hours. Remember, many of them were seniors, and also the crew had been working for just over eight hours. So they were very determined to get on the ground as as quickly as possible and so since they had actually another two hours left of fuel they asked to stay in the holding pattern in case that the airport opens up sooner and unfortunately they were declined this request and told to land at Tenerife. 45 minutes later around 2 15 local time Pan Am also lands at Tenerife. And again, since Tenerife was such a small regional airport, they only had two controllers, one controller controlling the ground and one controlling approaches. And as Pan Am was landing, they actually had so much trouble understanding the Spanish accent of the ground controller that they had to confirm their taxi instructions with the approach controller. So there was definitely a little bit of a language barrier there. But regardless, the Pan Am aircraft landed safely at Tenerife and joined the queue after the KLM. And by that point, KLM pilots actually decided to let their passengers into the terminal and made the decision to refuel. Now they actually had plenty of fuel to get from Tenerife back to Gran Canaria, but they decided to still refuel because of crew scheduling. Just the year prior, the Dutch authorities came up with a very strict regulation on how many hours a crew can work for consecutively versus how much rest they have to get in between. And this wasn't a straightforward rule, it was a very complex calculation of different factors and different hours. So even the KLM pilots themselves were a little confused as to how much time they had to fly back to Amsterdam, but they definitely knew that this window was getting smaller and smaller. So they decided to refuel at Tenerife to minimize the amount of time they would have to spend on land at Gran Canaria and could fly back to Amsterdam as quickly as possible. So around 2.30 in the afternoon, Gran Canaria airport was open once again, but KLM was still in the process of refueling and the Pan Am that was stuck behind the KLM KLM also couldn't move as well. Since it was such a small airport, there wasn't enough room to move around. So both aircrafts waited for KLM to finish refueling. But also during this process, really bad weather set in. So Tenerife was actually around 2,000 feet above sea level. So the clouds of the islands surrounding it would actually be at around ground level at Tenerife. So very often the island had foggy weather and low visibility. And that's exactly what happened during this refueling process. Process. So both KLM and Pan Am had to be further delayed due to this weather. Finally, at 4.45, all the refueling was done, the passengers were back on board, and the crew was ready to go. So around 4.50, KLM, then Pan Am, were given the clearance to start their engines. The captain of the KLM flight, Captain Van Zanten, actually said to his crew, 
hurry or else it will close again, referring to the fog. So both crew and their passengers have been very eager to get off the ground. At that point, the Pan Am crew had actually been working for 11 hours already. So around 5 p.m., both planes were ready to go and ready to take off. Now, both of these planes were still sitting on the main taxiway that was running parallel to the runway. And in order to take off, they needed to be on the runway, obviously, but on the other side of the airport. So the plan was for both aircrafts to taxi down the runway. So the KLM would taxi all the way down the runway to an 180 degree turn. Meanwhile, the Pan Am would take the third exit off of the runway onto the unobstructed part of the main taxiway and take that all the way down to the other side. So during this process, then the KLM can take off. So you might be able to see what can go wrong here. So air traffic control directed KLM to taxi down the runway and for Pan Am to follow it. They also told Pan Am to take the third taxiway off of the runway. Now by the time that Pan Am entered the runway, the visibility was very poor. They could only see about 100 meters in front. And on top of this, the taxiways actually weren't marked because again, this is a small regional airport. So the Pan Am pilots had no choice but to count the taxiways as they pass them to see which one they should exit at. Also, by air traffic control directions, what the Pan Am needed to do was actually make a 148 degree turn to the left, followed by another 148 degree turn to the right. Now, further analysis proves that this actually would have been practically impossible for such a large aircraft to perform on such a narrow taxiway. It was possible that the pilots saw this and thought, well, air traffic control must have meant the next exit. And instead of confirming with air traffic control, they just went to the next one instead, which turned out to actually be the fourth taxiway. So around the same time, the KLM had done their 180 degree turn and was now lined up with the runway to take off. And at this point, the captain starts to advance his throttles and the plane starts to roll forward. At this point, the first officer reminds him that they did not have air traffic control clearance yet. So the captain eases back and says, well, let's ask for it then. So the first officer transmits on the radio, we're ready to take off, waiting for ATC clearance. And in response to this, the controller said, KLM 8705, you are clear to pop up beacon, climb to and maintain flight level 900. Turn right after takeoff. Proceed with heading 040 until intercepting the 325 radial from Las Palmas VOR. Now this was actually instructions for where the aircraft should go after takeoff and was not a clearance for takeoff. Usually this is given way in advance of the aircraft being ready for takeoff, but since the KLM crew was preoccupied with their takeoff checklist, they waited until the last moment to get this instruction. And unfortunately, you'll notice that in the controller response, he opens with, you are cleared, and also contains the word takeoff in the sentence. So this may have added to the confusion of the KLM crew as they were busy doing other stuff as well. But regardless, the KLM first officer repeated back this instruction and followed that with, we are now at takeoff. The captain actually interrupted this readback by saying, we are going. This is definitely not standard protocol. So in response to this, the controller said, okay, likely in response to the first officer's confirmation. And just to be clear, he followed that up with, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. But at the same time, the Pan Am crew had also heard the KLM transmission that they were going to take off and said, hey, we are still taxiing down the runway. But unfortunately, since both the controller and the Pan Am crew were trying to radio at the exact same time, they actually canceled each other out. And the only thing that was heard in the KLM cockpit was okay, followed by a high-pitched squeal. Again, at this point, visibility was so bad that the planes couldn't see each other, the tower couldn't see the planes, and it was a bad situation. And as the KLM flight was moving forward to take off, the tower said to Pan Am, report when runway clear, and the Pan Am crew confirmed this. Now, unfortunately, for the very first time and the only time that day, in this message, the controller decided to use the call sign Papa Alpha for Pan Am, instead of using Clipper as it had been the entire day, which was likely the call sign that KLM pilots had associated to the aircraft behind it. So upon hearing Papa Alpha, the KLM pilots didn't really react, except for the flight engineer who picked up on this transmission and said, well, are they not clear of the runway yet? 
And to this, the captain responded, oh yes, and continued on with takeoff. So you can imagine what happens next. The Pan Am spotted the landing lights of the KLM approaching them very quickly. It was very clear that this aircraft was not going to be able to stop. The KLM crew decides to pull the nose up prematurely to try to fly over the Pan Am. And it actually clears it with its nose wheel, but its left engine and also the lower half of its fuselage ended up colliding with the upper section of the Pan Am on the ground. At the same time, the Pan Am crew was trying to veer sharply into the grass and apply full power to get out of the way as quickly as possible, but still the impact couldn't be avoided. And the KLM actually remained airborne for a couple of seconds, but its outer left engine was torn off and a lot of scrap metal pieces have been ingested by the inner left engine, so both of them were no longer working. And so the plane rolled to the left very violently and entered into a stall, and ended up crashing 150 meters down the runway. Unfortunately, all 243 passengers on the KLM passed away, and so did 334 passengers in the Pan Am flight, but fortunately 61 people on the Pan Am flight survived. Most of them were sitting on the first class section in the main deck, and also behind the left side wing, the side away from the impact. And fortunately, a lot of these passengers were able to walk out onto the left wing to wait for rescue, which actually didn't come for a very long time because firefighters didn't realize that there were actually two planes involved in the crash and were focused on the KLM flight instead. So very quickly, authorities from the US, the Netherlands, and Spain came to the crash site to figure out what happened and also help the survivors. And after listening to cockpit voice recordings and also interviews with the Pan Am crew, all of whom survived, it was very clear what happened. So what exactly were the factors that led to this crash? Well, first was definitely the bombing of Gran Canaria Island that led to all flights being diverted to a much smaller airport. Second was the fact that Tenerife was a very small regional airport that obviously wasn't designed to handle so many commercial flights and large aircrafts. So it was a lot of congestion, not a lot of mobility. And the fact that it was such a small regional airport could have also attributed to the fact that air traffic control didn't have as much experience handling such a large number of jets. The third was crew scheduling. This could have been the reason that the KLM crew was in such a rush to take off because they knew that they were approaching the time limit that they had to go back to Amsterdam. And this was the reason why the crew decided to take on more fuel at Tenerife, which is number four, the decision to refuel. As a result of refueling, the weather had changed from good to very poor, forcing both the Pan Am and KLM aircraft to take off in not very good conditions. Also, the weight from this additional fuel made it harder for the KLM flight to get off the ground and clear the Pan Am in time. And after it impacted the ground, all of this extra fuel combusted immediately into a fireball and was very difficult to put out for hours afterwards, which limited access to rescue passengers as well. During takeoff, there was also use of very ambiguous phrasing between the pilots and the air traffic control, saying things like, we are going, or okay. These are definitely not standard aviation terminology. There was also a very large difference in rank in the KLM cockpits. Remember, the captain of the KLM flight was a very senior and respected pilot. He was also the pilot to actually give the qualification check to that first officer just two months prior. So maybe because of this, the first officer and the flight engineer were hesitant to bring up their concerns over this takeoff clearance. So potentially, they were intimidated by this difference in rank. Lastly is crew fatigue. Remember, the crew of both of these aircrafts had been operating for over nine hours at this point and were probably very exhausted and just wanting to go home. This fatigue could have plagued their decision making and also made them in a rush to go home and get some rest. So what changes then has this accident brought forth? Well, now there is much more strict regulations on ATC communication with pilots. For pilots to confirm air traffic control directions, they can't say okay or roger. They need to repeat that direction back. Also, the word takeoff can only be used to give takeoff clearance or cancel takeoff clearance. At every other context, the word departure needs to be used instead. This accident also led to a much larger restructuring of how air traffic controls are trained and supervised. Crew training now also encourages a team decision-making process and encourages everyone to speak up and voice concerns regardless of rank, which is just a good thing to begin with. And lastly, at this Tenerife North Airport, ground radar system has been put in to avoid this from ever happening again in the future.
future. So there you have it, the Tenerife Airport accident, the deadliest air accident in history that took place on the ground. I guess just as a result of these 747s being enormous people carrying machines unfortunately. So let me know what your thoughts are on this new series, Made in Mysteries, and what you think of this episode. Should I do more? Should I go back to my old videos? Uh, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Honestly, I really enjoy the process of making these types of videos and doing this research because it's what I do anyway. And uh, I think reading these like NTSB reports and all of these accident reports is, is super interesting, but it is a lot of work. So hats off to all of these you know, true crime videos and YouTubers out there because it's, it's definitely more effort than I was expecting. But regardless, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel and I will see you guys next time. Now when I was a kid, I loved this show. Oh no. <laughs> this happened in March of 1977. What, what was I going to say?